Welcome back to the channel, folks. In this century, we'll be taking a look at Villas Cohagen from the 1990s Total Recall. But before we get into it, a small disclaimer needs to be made. Namely, that what we're going to run through comes from Quaid's perspective, whether that's actually rooted in reality or simply a delusion of his own fantasy. It's a testament to the skill of ambiguity of the filmmakers that the ending of the film has remained ambiguous to this day, with an equally strong case possible for both interpretations. If it's all in Quaid's imagination, then perhaps the real Cohagen might be very different from what we see in the film. But for the scope of this video, we'll take the film experience at face value and simply look at the character of Cohagen through the lens of Quaid. As the oppressively selfish and malevolent ruler of Mars, Cohagen is no stranger to enjoying a life of luxury at the expense of others. Being one of the first colonizers of the planet, Cohagen saw his chance for easy advancement and he took it, making his underhanded profit through cutting costs in the construction of the oxygen supplying domes. This by itself is an indicator of the extreme greed attributed to him. By being in control of the supply of breathable air, the most vital element of survival, Cohagen is already guaranteed a never-ending demand for his product, a demand which would propel him to the top of the economy, especially since he has no competitors. The fact that he still resorts to cutting corners in the construction of the domes, the savings of which would amount to a meager sum relative to his guaranteed profit, highlights just how stingy he is in his conduct of business. In this fictional setting on Mars, it's somewhat acceptable that breathable air comes at a price, just like how in the real world clean water comes at an expense, as there are resources involved in their purification process. Whether the breathable air is charged at a fair and reasonable rate is another matter altogether and Cohagen greedily exploits the inelastic demand for his product by constantly raising the price while the public has no choice but to comply. But as wicked as he is, there is one saving grace in Cohagen's approach, namely the fact that he is unaware of the truth about Mars, and due to misinformation from his scientist, he mistakenly believes that activating the reactor would lead to a global meltdown. So at least in his own eyes, he is the savior of Mars, and given that he sincerely holds this opinion to the end, it would seem that Cohagen genuinely believes that the reactor is dangerous. Of course, being sincere doesn't mean you are right, and there's also the strong possibility that even if Cohagen knew the truth about Mars, that breathable air is indeed freely available for all, he would still conceal it out of his self-centeredness choosing to keep the planet at its knees to ensure their reliance on him so that he can line his pockets and stroke his ego. As you would expect if someone holding control over a commodity as crucial as breathable air, Cohagen enjoys a significant level of importance in his community, a job which he describes as the highest position in the planetary system, one that he attributes to his supposed high level of happiness. It would be hard to dispute with the notion that he has Mars in the figurative palm of his hand, with Cohagen being able to enforce his will via his military dictatorship, or simply through cutting off the air supply in whichever sector that becomes a thorn in his side, leaving his unfortunate victims to suffer an asphyxiating death. The phrase absolute power corrupts absolutely is perhaps relevant here, as Cohagen is free to make up the laws as he alone sees fit, inflicting cruelly unjust punishment with no one to keep him in check. A man driven by an insatiable desire for dominion, a trait indirectly highlighted in the privacy of his office, with Cohagen beholding the vast landscape of Mars in complete admiration of the work of his selfish ambition, a land which he is about to conquer to the uttermost subjugating its inhabitants to bow to his oppressive rule. This moment of admiration is so intense that Cohagen is caught up in it and doesn't respond when Richter calls out to him after being summoned. Despite his tight grip of control over the colony, one thing, however, stands in Cohagen's way of total domination of the planet, 
the rebel faction opposing his totalitarian rule, many of whom are mutants who, in a twist of fate, are the inadvertent byproduct of the poor quality of air for which he is directly responsible. These mutants prove to be quite the adversary, in particular due to their paranormal abilities which has allowed them to evade capture time after time. It bears witness to the shrewd ingenuity of Cohagen that he would be capable of forming such a deviously elaborate plan with his right-hand man Hauser, who would erase his memory so as to bypass the psychic abilities of the rebels, infiltrating their ranks and gaining their trust. We see that Cohagen is a hard man, not just in his vengeful dealings with the rebels, but also with his own subordinates, specifically in the case with Richter, being quick to adopt a fiery temper and whipping him into compliance by threatening to erase his memory, a method that is not unlike the manner in which Cohagen conducts the rest of his affairs, aggressive, dominating, and demeaning, embodying the notion of my way or the highway. This style is also evident in something as fundamental as his body language. When he decides something as trivial as where Richter would sit, combined with the way he flares his arms out in a power pose to look more imposing and authoritative. Cohagen appears to have a low opinion of Richter and refrains from trusting him with the full scope of his plan. Given the scenario where Hauser's identity has to remain a secret for his plan to succeed, it's somewhat reasonable that Cohagen chooses to compartmentalize the information. But even if there was no need for secrecy, Cohagen comes off as the kind of leader who would still degrade his subordinates and order them to fulfill his will without exercising any independent thought of their own. As he tells Richter, don't think, just do it. Other than his relationship with Hauser, the only other life forms that Cohagen appears to have some affinity to are his pet goldfish, placed in a central location in his office. But if his overall behavior is any indication of his mindset, then the goldfish are simply an extension of how he views the citizens of Mars, helplessly dependent on him for the most basic sustenance of air, one which he can deprive them of at any moment and cut short their lives. In a twist of fate, Cohagen's plan inadvertently leads to his own demise, after Hauser, now adopting the persona of Doug Quaid, learns the truth about Mars and decides to end his tyrannical rule, leaving Cohagen to bear the same suffocating fate as his victims. But at the end, a silver lining remains, the possibility that it's all a delusion in Quaid's mind, and somewhere the real Cohagen is still alive and well. As with the film's conclusion, this remains one of the mysteries of Hollywood that we have to be content with not knowing for sure.